Hi, my name is Warren Meyer. I've been writing and speaking in the climate debate for over 10 years now. And today's presentation is a version of one I've given uh, for a number of years now with all the data updated. It's called Understanding the Climate Debate, the Lost Middle Ground. Now talking about the middle ground in any debate seems like an innocuous approach to a topic. But in fact, just a few weeks ago, I was actually banned uh, from speaking at an event. It was a public private uh, forum, which included some representatives of the city of Los Angeles who required the organizers not to allow me to speak. And in doing so, they said a couple things. They said that you know I was violating the scientific consensus and therefore I was anti-scientific and uh, they called me a climate denier. Now we think about this I'm sure everybody's heard of this 97% climate consensus, and, and there's been several studies trying to get to the same number over and over again. But one of the things you seldom hear is they said that 97% of climate scientists agree. But what is it they agree to? Climate science is a very complicated uh, proposition. There's lots of different things going on in it. So what are these guys agreeing to? And it's going to turn out, we're going to come back to this at the end, that one of the uh, things that make the climate de uh, debate so difficult, particularly for our skeptics, is that folks will not be clear exactly what they're talking about when they talk about this consensus. And it'll turn out that this, in this particular case, this 97% consensus is going to be surprising, but we'll leave that for the end. So I get called a climate denier. Now that's obviously a stupid term in and of itself because nobody denies there's a climate. So obviously that's somehow a shorthand for some other phrase. Uh, do they mean that I'm a climate change denier? Well, I know almost nobody that denies that the, that the climate changes. Uh, perhaps I'm a man-made climate change denier. But in fact, you'll see in this presentation, I talk about several ways in which I agree that man changes the climate from greenhouse gases to uh, land use. And so I'm obviously not a man-made climate change denier. So we need to be clear again on the proposition. If I'm going to agree with something, if I'm going to support something, it's a consensus for something, if I'm going to deny something, what exactly am I denying? And the proposition I tend to deny is catastrophic man-made global warming theory. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is not just global warming, though we'll talk about temperatures on the planet, and not just man-made global warming, though we'll talk about greenhouse gas theory and such, but we talk about catastrophic man-made global warming theory. That means uh, global warming that leads to climate changes that are so severe that they demand um, immediate and expensive and extensive climate action. And it is that catastrophe, that need for immediate and extensive climate action uh, that I deny. As a framework for the presentation today, I'm going to talk about these five topics. I actually really try to be fair, uh, sort of the Brian Kaplan's uh, ideological Turing test, to, to, to present the argument with which I'm disagreeing as fairly as possible. So this is really not meant to represent any sort of straw man, and it's been tested in front of a lot of climate scientists, and many people disagree with me, and they agree with the basic structure of how they, I portray their argument, though of course they, they disagree with some of the evaluations. But, but if you go up to the top boxes, then we're going to talk about theory, but we're going to talk about the theory in two parts, because probably one of the most important things for you to take away from this presentation is that global warming or catastrophic global warming theory is actually a two-part theory. Part one where is greenhouse gas theory, that greenhouse gas has caused some incremental warming, but there's a part two that says that there are a completely independent theory that says there are feedbacks in the climate that multiply this incremental warming into a catastrophe. In terms of observations, obviously theories are worthless unless we can confirm them from observations. And so I think the, the, the basic argument, and by the way, all of this comes from the UN IPCC. The IPCC is a climate model panel under the auspices of the United Nations that meets every four or five or six years to try to come up with a synthesis of, of climate research or at least uh, their parts of the climate research they like. And um, so I think they would agree, if you went to the IPCC and said, what do they actually say about observationally, they would say that the world has warmed perhaps eight tenths of a degree Celsius, we can quibble on the tenths, and that they would argue that all of this warming, and maybe even more, and we'll talk about how that could be true, 
is due to man-made CO2. So that warming is not natural, it's all due to man. And then finally, given all this warming from man, um, that warming will cause, uh, in the theory, a lot of negative climate effects. And you've probably seen in the media everything from more hurricanes and tornadoes to glaciers melting to seas rising to more snow and less snow and more rain and less rain and et cetera, et cetera. I think it's important to, to make sure everybody understands there's no, even though the media sometimes talks this way, there's no theory where CO2 can directly cause these effects. CO2, more CO2 doesn't directly cause hurricanes or glaciers melting or more rain or less rain or any of these other climate change effects. It, CO2 in the atmosphere only causes those things to happen potentially through the intermediate stage of warming. So you first, in, in a sense, that's another uh, kind of part or chain in the theory that's necessary to say that even when you prove that there's this warming from CO2, you then have to say that this warming causes the, the, these other effects. So we're going to begin walking through those five categories and we'll begin again up in the theory category with the first part of the two-part theory. And that first part is a doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere by, say, from man-made sources of CO2 will increase temperatures about one degree C and that's the greenhouse gas effect. And I, and it may surprise you to learn, many or even most prominent skeptics completely agree with that statement. So let's talk about the greenhouse gas theory just to make sure we all understand it because uh, often the media doesn't really explain it. They just talk about it like you should know what it is. Um, if you talk about a very high level, we begin with the first step where the sun warms the earth. So the sun radiates energy. It, some of it's reflected by the earth into space, but some of it is absorbed. Uh, and, and warms the surface of the earth. Most of that is actually absorbed in the oceans. The oceans have over 90% of the heat carrying capacity on the surface of the earth. The atmosphere air uh, has a very little bit of that heat. But anyway, most a, a lot of that energy is absorbed. If the earth just continued to absorb and absorb and absorb the energy of the sun, it would just get hotter and hotter and hotter. But temperatures stay in balance because the earth in turn re-radiates uh, energy, heat, back into space. And you can see the different squiggles there that, that implies that it's re-radiated on a number of different wavelengths. So anyway, the radiation comes in and is re-radiated back in space and Earth's temperatures in some sense moves around to keep those roughly in balance. Now this process gets interrupted uh, by greenhouse gases. And we already have a lot of greenhouse gases, water and methane and CO2 all exist naturally. And it's one of the reasons the Earth's temperature is as congenial as it is, we'd be much cooler without them. But if we add more greenhouse gases, we're going to show that with the purple. That purple line, let's just say that's CO2, which is actually a weak greenhouse gas, but we'll say that's CO2. And you can see on that middle uh, radiation band, it's absorbing some of that radiation going into space. There's less that makes it in space. It gets absorbed in that layer of CO2. CO2 absorbs some radiation, uh, but not all of it. And you can see that happening here. Over time, it absorbs more and more and more of certain wavelengths. And then at some point, that just that ends, that, that, that saturates. There's no more of those uh, radiation bands left to be absorbed. And that's why the absorption of CO2, which we'll see in a minute, has a diminishing return effect on temperature. Each incremental uh, molecule of CO2 has less warming effect than the last one. And then this is how you actually get the warming because that CO2 is sitting up in the troposphere, say in the lower troposphere, and maybe the lower troposphere gets warm, but how would we actually warm the Earth? What happens is that CO2 then re-radiates uh, that energy that it's absorbed, and some of that goes into space, but some of it gets radiated back to Earth. So we think of that as another forcing. That's another set of radiation coming into Earth that changes the temperature band uh, the temperature balance and pushes the equilibrium temperature higher with more add, by adding more uh, radiation, heat radiation energy coming into the earth. Okay, so Dave, you've probably seen a lot of charts with forecasts of temperature from CO2. And what they probably have is years in temperature. And they sort of say over the years, we expect this much temperature increase. The problem with those charts is that they combine many different 
uh, assumptions. For example, if you they combine assumptions about how much CO2 is going to be added to the atmosphere with the temperature sensitivity, how much temperature rise should we see from CO2. So we're going to disaggregate that. And right now we're just going to look at the temperature increase directly from a change in CO2. And then we'll talk later about what years those numbers, we might hit those numbers. So the bottom axis is atmospheric CO2 concentration in parts per million. Parts per million, by the way, is a very small number. We're currently at about 400 parts per million. That's the same as 0.04% or four one hundredths of the percent of the atmosphere is a CO2. And on the other uh, axis, we're going to see the temperature increase. Obviously, that's not absolute temperature. We're going to start from zero, meaning this is just how much above current temperatures we might expect uh, global temperatures to rise. That equation in, in, at the top there, which is very complicated, it's a logarithmic equation, is the estimate of with CO2 acting alone in the atmosphere, and they can do tests in laboratories looking at CO2 absorption and emission spectrums. Um, that is what's thought to be or estimated to be the effect of CO2 in the atmosphere. And we've graphed it in green because it's hard to figure out what that formula means. And we've graphed it in green there. So we've set 400 as our zero point so that temperatures rise from where we are right now, which is 400 ppm. And you can see it rises. You can see the diminishing return relationship I saw. You can see it sort of sloping down over time that we talked about before. And you can see it sloping up. And, and as uh, concentration doubles from 400 to 800, you get about 1.2 degrees C of warming. This is a very accepted number. Michael Mann is, is not a skeptic. He's one of the uh, strongest uh, advocates for climate action. Um, but skeptics also generally agree with the number of 1 to 1.2 C from CO2 acting alone. And then if you over, overlay uh, CO2 atmospheric forecasts from the IPCC, I think a lot of these are exaggerated, uh, but we're not going to get into all that. We'll accept them from now. They have all these funny labels like A2 and A1B for their forecasts. But suffice it to say, based on those numbers, you would expect a likely CO2 range in the year 2100 in the atmosphere of 600 to 750. I think we'll be at the low end of that. But nevertheless, that would imply a warming from CO2 directly, say, from 0.8 to 1.1 uh, degrees C. Now, if you look at that, you're going to say, you want to call BS on me and say, okay, this is obviously some skeptic fantasy. This is fake news or whatever the terms we use right now, because I've never seen a forecast as low as one degree from warming. It's all three and four and five and 10 degrees, these, these much more catastrophic forecasts. In fact, that's correct. But remember, I told you from the beginning that this is a two that that even though you don't see it discussed in the media, the one thing I'd like you to take away from this presentation is that the mainstream global man-made global warming theory is a two-part theory, and it's only the second part of this theory that really gets you to the catastrophe. Uh, so in the first part, we said the doubling of CO2 directly increases temperatures about 1C. Now we're going to talk about how feedbacks are assumed to multiply this by many times. Now we have to ask, what is a feedback? A feedback is a uh, characteristic of dynamic systems. We'll talk about each in turn. A negative feedback is something that tends to keep the system to push back when a system wants to move, to, to, to damp it, to deaccelerate it. So a, a negative feedback is like that situation of the ball sitting in the bottom of that bowl. If you tap that ball, it's going to end up back about where it started. Uh, your tap, the effect of your tap is damped by the shape of that bowl. Um, positive feedback is just the opposite. Uh, it's that ball sitting on the very tip of that mountain where a very small disturbance um, will cause the ball to roll much further than you expect. Positive feedback, the initial input, the system tends to amplify it, it tends to add to it, it tends to push with it. And that's positive feedback. And we see both of these effects in the climate. And I'm going to give you two examples, but there are many. Uh, an example of negative feedback in the climate, at least from the, the temperature system of the climate, is clouds, cloud formation. Now, if temperatures were to rise, you would expect the oceans to get warmer. Most of the heat from a temperature rise goes into the oceans. If the oceans and the water gets warmer, then you would expect more water to vaporize. As that water vaporizes, um, as that water vaporizes, 
it forms clouds in the atmosphere. Those clouds, if they're cumulus type clouds, can actually shelter the Earth from sunlight. They can actually reflect sunlight into space. And so that would in turn cool the Earth. So an initial warming effect creates clouds, which in turn offsets that warming and causes a cooling effect, this umbrella effect of the clouds. That's a negative feedback. A positive feedback is like Arctic ice. Arctic ice is like a big mirror. And so it reflects a lot of sunlight and heat back into space. That's why the Arctic is even cooler than you might expect if you didn't take ice into account. If you melt some of that ice, that mirror gets smaller. Less heat gets reflected in space and more gets absorbed, which is going to warm the Earth. But that warming of the Earth is going to melt more ice, which is going to make more sunlight hit the Earth, which is going to cause more warming. And so you get this positive feedback, this loop that just builds on itself. And that's, that's an example of positive feedback in the climate. So if we take our initial projection of the no feedback projection in green, we can overlay other forecasts and see how they're much higher. For example, you get the IPCC has forecasts from three to five degrees C for a doubling of CO2. And then you get these very high alarmist forecasts that might say we get eight, nine, 10 degrees, and that's an orange from a doubling of CO2. So what's going on here is that that first green bar is coming from greenhouse gas theory. And that's the bar that almost everybody agrees with and you get incremental warming of about a degree over the next century. However, this second theory of positive feedback says that that initial incremental warming is multiplied many, many times. And so you see that one of the ironic things about this whole debate is though most people have never seen any discussion of this positive feedback theory in the media when talking about global warming. In fact, most of the warming and the more warming forecasts come not from greenhouse gas effect, but come from this positive feedback theory. Without the positive feedback theory, the warming would be, you know, would be barely noticeable and a much more incremental uh, effect. In fact, if you were to go and if you were to go and talk to a uh, natural scientist outside the climate world and ask them, you know, and say that you had this long-term stable system that's been stable for millions of years, and and tell them that was dominated by very high levels of positive feedback, they would say they were skeptical. They would say that doesn't make any sense. That in effect, most natural long-term stable systems are dominated by negative feedback. So there's a case to be made, in fact that maybe there should be a negative feedback case, not just positive feedback cases that says, in fact, the warming is less than one degree because we actually have these things like cloud formation that offset the warming and, and cause, it, cause uh, the future warming to be even less than one degree, less than we might expect from greenhouse gases. So you see we're left with a range of forecasts depending on, on really not the greenhouse gas assumptions we make, but what assumptions we make about feedback. Is it negative? Is it positive? Is it really highly positive? Well, there's only so much we can solve by sitting in just talking theory. So the way we solve dueling theories in, in, in science is we go to observations. And so we're going to look at these two observations. And the first one from the IPC would say the world has warmed about 0.8 C over the last century. And I'm going to agree with that. I'm going to show you two different temperature metrics, but basically the world has warmed. We can quibble over the 0.8 C, whether it's 0.8 or 0.9, or whether the temperature metrics are exactly accurate. But the world is certainly warm. This is this there. This is from surface thermometers. This is how you would expect it to be to be measured. These thermometers at various places, like at the airport, and they choose some of those and they aggregate them and they spatially average them. And there's a bunch of different people who do this, and there's different quality of those results. And I've used the same one the IPCC uses as their gold standard from the Hadley Center, the Hadley CRUT4. But you'll see other people try, taking their shot at averages. And across the bottom, you see dates from 1850 to 2010 or to 2015. And up the top, you see temperatures and degrees C, but you won't see temperatures you expect. Uh, on a nice day, and you, know, you might see 25 degree, 20 degree C temperatures. Here you're seeing zero, that's like freezing. Is that really what you're saying? Is that the average temperature of the earth is zero? And in fact, we're not. What those temperatures almost always are in these charts is something called a temperature anomaly. And we need to take a second and explain what an anomaly is. An anomaly is defined for a particular location and temperature as the difference between the current temperature 
and the long-term average for that day for the temperature. So let's say we're sitting in Omaha and the long-term average for a particular day is 20 degrees C and today it's 21 degrees C. That would be a plus a positive one degree C anomaly. It's one degree hotter than the long-term average. And there's a theory which better be right because pretty much everyone uses this, is that it's much easier to add and spatially average anomalies than it is to the, the base temperatures. And so you'll almost always see this format. But it doesn't really matter because um, what you're really looking at is not the absolute value, but the change over time. And, and by looking at anomalies, we can see the change over time. You see the blue is the, 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 the monthly averages that they've computed for the globe. The orange is a five-year running average, and you definitely see an increase um, over the last century. It's, it's hard to deny that that exists. There are other ways of looking at temperature. Uh, the, the surface temperature records have problems. They're subject to some biases, which we can talk about in a second. And, and, and it's hard to spatially average things when there's large areas of the Earth, like the Antarctic or the center of Africa. They don't really have reliable thermometers or much history. So another way to do this is you have satellites in space that can actually measure the temperatures of the lower troposphere. That's temperatures up in the atmosphere a couple miles up. Now, their advantage is they're not subject to these surface biases, and they can see large swaths of the Earth at the same time, and so you don't get this. It's not as hard to do this to, to the, the geographic averaging. But the flip side is they're not actually looking at the surface. I mean, we really care about the surface, and they're looking at the temperature in the troposphere. Um, however, if you go to the most of the IPCC materials, scientists will say that they expect the, the largest amounts of warming in the tropospheres, partic particularly the lower troposphere over the tropics. So to some extent, the satellites are looking at exactly what we'd like to look at to look for a global warming signal. This is where scientists say we should see it first. So it's sort of a canary in the coal mine. So since the satellites were put up in the late 70s, we can look at a temperature. And again, you see exactly the same thing as the surface temperature record. You see a warming history. Uh, and it's done the same way. The blue is the monthly averages and the orange is the moving average. Um, now, the temperature increase for the same period is a little less than we saw in the Hadley metric. The Hadley showed about 1.7 C per century um, for this period. The, you, the, the, the satellites are showing about 1.2 C. That could just be variation between different data sources and errors. It could also be due to some positive biases that have gone uncorrected in some of the surface temperature record. A lot of the surface temperatures, 100 years ago, most of these thermometers were sitting out in the countryside. Now, where do we measure temperatures? We measure at the airport in the middle of cities. This is a temperature station that until I took this picture and embarrassed everybody, um, it was part of, at that time, the US official temperature record. So this is one of the thermometers that was showing a global warming signal. But one reason it had a global warming signal is 100 years ago, it was measuring temperatures in a pasture in the middle of the desert. And now it's measuring in a parking lot surrounded by cars and air conditioning and buildings and concrete. Um, I, I, most folks uh, agree that cities uh, accumulate a lot of heat the, the, and, and there's a thing called the, the, the urban heat island effect. And so there's an argument that maybe the urban heat island is adding some bias into the surface temperature record. But at some level, it doesn't matter that the basic thing you need to take away from this is almost every way you measure temperature, we've seen warming over the last century. However, though I agree there's been warming, there's two propositions you see all the time that I want to disagree with. The first is you see all the time that global warming is accelerating. And you see the, so a bunch of Google results for this. There's hundreds of thousands of results of people saying global warming is accelerating. And in fact, if you went onto Google right now and searched it, you'd see one of those little fact boxes. They pull things out that they consider to be such an obvious fact that they'll just give you the fact like, you know, Halle Berry's birthday. Um, but they've actually pulled out a fact box that says global warming is accelerating. So if it's so much of a fact, I suppose we should be able to see it in one of our temperature metrics. But in fact, Spoiler alert, but we're not going to be able to see it, but I'll show, let's, let's walk through it. One of the hard things about uh, doing uh, temperature measurement over time is everybody wants to be uh, a cherry picker. Uh, for example, if they want to show cooling, I'll go from here down to here. If I want to show strong warming, I'll go from this point up to that point. 
And so it's just the cherry picker's delight. What I've done is what economists do. Economists, when they're looking, have the same problem when they look at economic growth over long periods of time because there's cycles, recessions and, and boom periods. And so they'll look peak to peak. They'll look from the top of a boom to the top of the next boom or the next boom after that and say, what was the economic growth, growth for the whole cycle? I've done the similar thing because in climate we have similar cycles. We have something called the El Nino effect. You've heard that. It's uh, tied to ocean cycles, which we'll discuss in a while. But you had a big El Nino peak in 1998-99. You had a recent one we just went through. And so I've done this peak to peak. From one peak to the next peak, what was the warming in the satellite record? And it was pretty much zero. That pretty much rounds to zero. That's almost nothing. That's a hundredth of a degree a year. So for the last 18 years. But go back 18 years before that, and we saw a very strong trend. So in the 36-year trend, we see a 1.2 C per century. In the more recent trend, we see near 0.1 C per century. This is not acceleration. This is deceleration. Now, temperatures may accelerate in the future. This may change. But for now, it is incorrect to say that global warming is accelerating. It simply is not. You cannot see in the record. Now, you might say, OK, well, that's in the satellite record. How about the surface temperature record? You said there was more warming in that. And so let's go back to our Hadley data. I've, this is the same Hadley chart I had before, but I've, I've honed in on recent years. And you can see exactly the same thing, though maybe a little less dramatically. Here's the peak to peak that we just showed for 18 years, 1.3 C. The whole 36 years, it's 1.7, 1.8 C. So again, even though it's a little less defined, you see deceleration, not acceleration, in the surface temperature record. So we have to say that global warming, at least right now, is not accelerating, which should give you pause if there's so many people saying it as an absolute fact when it's clearly not true from the data. The other thing you hear in the debate all the time is that global warming is faster or worse or whatever than predicted. And again, you'll see zillions of results for this. This is a little harder because you know, we can't really go back to just the IPCC report from three or four years ago. It's unfair to look at only the first three or four years from a hundred year forecast. Um, but we do have a forecast that's run actually for almost all of its duration. And that was from a seminal event, which was James Hansen's 1988 temperature uh, uh, testimony from Congress. It was a seminal event. It was really most global warming action folks consider that to be the point that, that, that global warming was really put on the table of public discourse. And so in that testimony, Hansen actually pre, uh, presented uh, three scenarios running from, uh, he presented in 88, but the, the forecasts appear to start in 86 and run through uh, 2018, 19, which is pretty much close to today. So we've run through most of this period. Now he had three scenarios. Unfortunately, he varied two variables in those scenarios, both CO2 production by man as well as the number of volcanoes. And so by having two different variables, it's hard to pin down a scenario that exactly matches where we are. However, I would argue we're nowhere close to C, and so we're somewhere between A and B. But it's going to turn out not to matter, and I'll show you why. By the way, one of the things that's really hard to do is to, how, you would think, well, we can just overlay actual temperatures on top of this. The problem is the historic temperature records keep getting updated. They keep modifying. Uh, constantly, and this is one of those little side debates in 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 the climate world, which we won't go into today. But there's a constant debate about whether or not these updates to past temperatures are valid, because they tend to always reduce past temperatures and increase current temperatures, thus increasing the apparent global warming signal. But nevertheless, it's hard to exactly overlay these on top of 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 a line because we don't know where to zero it, where to match it. So an easier way to do it is to say within those lines from 86 to 2019, there was an implied warming trend. We can just figure the trend out in the line. That's easy to do. The A, the, the A forecast had an implied trend of 3.1 C per century. That's that trend line. The B forecast had an implied trend of 2.8 C per century. And so we can compare those trends to what we've actually seen without actually having to worry all about all this zero stuff. And if you look at the actual trends, the trends in the surface temperature from Hadley Center has been 1.8 C, and the trend from the satellite record is 1.2 C. So depending on the, the measurement technology you want to use, we, use, we see from slightly over a third to slightly over a half of the warming here. But certainly, the warming has been much less than Hansen anticipated. 
And so in this sense, for the one long-term forecast we've been able to live through, we see that it is not true that global warming is worse than expected. At least so far, global warming has been less uh, dramatic than we expected. The IPCC was finally forced to admit something similar in their fifth report. They'd been criticized from their previous reports of never going back and checking their forecasts. Uh, so that's what you hear is, is these colored bands are the forecast ranges from the various first, second, third, fourth report. The gray is the error bars. They, they never really were very clear about those error bars when they presented the forecast, but when it gives them a bigger area now to hit, they, they include them. But anyway, this is the actual temperatures, and they did this back in 2011, 2012. And you can see the actual temperatures have been running at the low end um, of these forecasts. Uh, we're probably up somewhere uh, in here in these forecasts today. So you, you, you sort of see we've been hitting the low ends of the band. So there's by no means are we worse than expected. If anything, we're at the low end uh, of the forecast ranges that, that have been presented in the past. Okay, so we've had, we agreed to have some warming. We can quibble about the amounts. But a more important issue is just because it's been warming doesn't prove global warming theory, man-made global warming theory, uh, because we don't know how much of that is due to man. And that's actually a really hard problem. We call it the attribution problem. And because nobody has a thermometer, and like in one hand they have a thermometer that says this is how much is due, uh, this is the temperature, and this is how much the temperature would have been without CO2. There's no really simple way of doing that. A lot of different approaches have been tried. Uh, for example, you may have heard of Michael Mann's hockey stick, which basically tried to argue that temperatures have been dead flat for the last thousand years and only just recently going up, implying that temperatures would have been flat without a man and we could attribute all the recent increase to man because they were, they were flat for a thousand years before. I think there's a lot of reasons to throw out the hockey stick and we'll see in a second. Most uh, past look backs of temperature don't show that dead flat behavior. Uh, there's been other effects at it, but, but right now I would say the primary way it's done is using computer models. And how it's done is this, and it's based on this period right here. Uh, and really, folks, we're sitting right here. So let's eliminate um, the future. So we're looking at things. So this is what they were looking in kind of 1999, 2000. They were looking at this increase and say, wow, things are kind of increasing a lot. And if we, if we throw a trend line through that, that's a that's a kind of a scary trend line. It's even scarier if we think that we're adding more and more CO2. Maybe that's the real trend line, and we're going to see this this huge increase in warming. And so what they did is they is is they built computer models, and they ran them two ways. They ran them um, with uh, man-made CO2 and without. And basically, without man-made CO2, their computer models did not show this much warming. But with man-made CO2, they did show this much warming. So that's how they said, attribution-wise, we think that this has to be, or a good chunk of this has to be due to man because our computer models won't, don't show that much warming um, unless you throw in man-made CO2. Now, this is odd for a couple of reasons. I'm just going to show you one thing, inter kind of interesting, but doesn't really constitute proof. But it's interesting is that they said this sort of, we're back to our Hadley data, they said this period had to be manned because this, this, the, the slope was so steep that it could only be unnatural. But the funny thing is we had a slope very similar in the historic record in this first circle in the early 20th century, well before we were burning uh, any fossil fuels in, in any magnitudes without a lot of CO2 production from man. And we saw a similar slope. So to some extent, they're arguing that this has to be man-made because it's so steep, even though this is about the same slope and almost had to be natural. But anyway, what we're going to do instead is the more, I think, cogent critique uh, of, of this approach to attribution to say, you know, the computer models can't simulate this unless you add man-made CO2 is the fact that that implies that the computer models are right. And there's really a lot of hubris to that because we only really been modeling climate for for a number for a limited number of years, and we already saw that some of the first climate models, like from James Hansen of the similar time, um, have actually not been at all correct in predicting temperatures. So there's a lot of hubris here to say that there's nothing that the climate models took everything into account, and so therefore it had to be uh, man-made CO2 because it, we took everything that was natural in account and, and couldn't model this. 
when in fact I can easily, uh, in a longer presentation, I list five or six or seven things that computer models leave out. I'm only going to discuss two. The first is sort of just a natural upward trend. And one of the things that you see um, once we've sort of shot down the hockey stick and we've gotten to the, the vast majority of reproductions of the temperatures, this is the temperature over the last 2,000 years, is what you tend to see is, is there's this peak around the year 1,000 to 1,200, 1,100 to 1,300, which we call the medieval warm period. And ask any medieval scholar and they will talk about the medieval warm period and the demographic effects of that all day long. And similarly, we've seen a cool period, 1600, 1700. Oddly enough, by the way, right here at the low point, it's just about when thermometers were invented. So it's not surprising we've always seen global warming because we sort of invented thermometers right at the, the low point of, of, of temperatures of the last uh, thousand years. But anyway, the, so we've seen even before man, because this is 1600, 1700s, we saw warming, natural warming through the 1600s and 1700s. So to say that this shouldn't be a part of the model, that we shouldn't assume there's some natural warming, you have to argue that somehow this natural warming process stopped maybe exactly at the same point that man-made effects took over. And that is a really odd assumption that would be highly coincidental, in fact, um, nobody has the least bit of proof for. So there's every reason to believe that whatever natural effects started us warming from the early, from the 1700s, 1800s, could still be at play today. So there could be some underlying natural warming underneath there. The other thing that's missing is particularly important for, for that period we talked about, here's your that same period, that 78 to 98 rise is their ocean cycles. And I've mentioned ocean cycles before, but let me explain them briefly. Uh, most of the heat in the Earth's surface is in the oceans. The air, the atmosphere holds just a tiny percentage of it. Um, and so small changes in the rate at which oceans liberate heat to the atmosphere or bury heat from the atmosphere into their depths can make big, big differences in the surface temperature. And so that's there are cycles of this. There's times uh, when the Atlantic, the Atlantic and Pacific, this is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation uh, called the PDO uh, and it's tied in with the El, El Nino effect you all have heard of it before. There are times when the oceans are burying heat from the atmosphere or more heat than they tend to and those are called cool periods because it cools the atmosphere and there are warm periods when the uh, oceans are liberating heat uh, to the surface. And, and creating warm periods. And you can see during these warm periods, and these warm periods are calculated in an independent way from, than just looking at the global temperatures, but you can see when there are warm periods in the PDO ocean cycle, the temperatures have a much higher slope, as in this, this period that's supposed to be no natural effects. And in cool periods, they have a much lower or even negative slope. And so there's a clear, seems to be a clear effect from this ocean cycle. But again, these ocean cycles were not included in the model. So this, this was somehow deemed not to be natural, even though it didn't include natural ocean cycles in the model, didn't include uh, you know, long-term warming out of the Little Ice Age. So I actually did it differently. I, I put this in for fun. I really should leave it out to shorten the presentation, but I have so much fun with it. About 10 years ago, I made a, a climate model. I included three things. I included a, a sine wave, and all these were based on regression factors. Sine wave, this is similar to the ocean cycle. So there's a sine wave, but there's no long-term trend in that. It just bounces up and down. And then I included a long-term effect. Call this like recovery from the little ice age, a long-term effect. And then I said, clearly, there is such a thing as greenhouse gas theory. It does have a warming effect. We started burning fossil fuels in earnest after World War II. And so let's include a, another trend upwards after World War II that we'll call a man-made trend. And if you put those three together, just add these three curves, you get this orange. This is no longer in the past the orange, I was a five-year, the orange was a five-year average. Now it's, now it's um, the, the, the model result. But if you add these, you get that orange line. You can see a pretty dang good relationship. In fact, this last month in January, uh, the temperatures came down from the El Nino and hit right on my line again. 
Um, you can see even better if you look at the, the, the five-year moving average, you can see that the five-year moving average is hanging right on that line. Well, beyond just being for fun, this allows you to do the attribution because if you look at these three pieces, you can then say how much of the total warming is from this contribute, the sine wave contributes nothing to long-term warming, how much is from this long-term effect, how much is from, from this man-made effect, and which gets to my attribution answer that implies that of the past warming we've seen during this whole 100, 150 year period, about half is due to man and about half is natural. And that's about as far as I can get with my limited tools having fun with this. There's a lot of different ways you can get to different answers to that, but I, I, that's always struck me as a pretty reasonable answer. The whole point of all this though, is not to just go on to intellectual, uh, you know, uh, navel gazing exercise about temperatures, but it was remember we we had a we had a theory where we had a series of theories. We had we knew how much or we we all tend to agree how much warming comes from greenhouse gases directly, but we have a whole range of forecasts, and those forecasts are because we have very different assumptions about about uh, feedback levels. And feedback levels are really hard to measure because you have to pick out individual effects when things are changing due to hundreds and thousands and millions of effects in the atmosphere. And so folks are taking different shots at this using satellites and looking at re-radiation to the, to the space, but no one's really cracked the code of how to directly measure feedback in any way that, that everybody can sort of agree to and agree with the results. But one thing we can do is we can take these different feedback-driven curves and if they're true in the future, they should be true in the past. So we can project them backwards. So this is where we've been in the past. We're sitting at 400. We started before man started putting CO2 in the air, maybe around 270. So we projected these backwards. And the values where they hit the axis, the negative values, that's how much warming, if this line is correct, this is how much warming we should have already seen over the last century. So if the super alarmist, very high positive feedback forecasts are correct, we should have seen five degrees C. If the IPCC range of forecasts are correct, we should have seen one and a half to two and a half degrees C of warming. If the no feedback case is correct, we should have seen six tenths. And again, I'm not talking about total warming, but I'm talking about man-made warming. So if you sort of say there's been eight tenths of a degree C warming, really only the no feedback case comes close to, to, to being consistent with that. We can kind of plot that on there. But really, we should be comparing these just since these are man-made warming lines, we should be comparing this to the man-made portion. So if we say man's portion was only half of past warming, then maybe a negative feedback case that comes in here is, is more like what's supported by the past data. This is why, by the way, if you go all the way back, I said that that the IPCC and alarmists and climate action advocates will say that a lot of the past, not only all of the past warming has been man, but but more than 100% of the past warming. They'll argue that 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 tempers would have fallen naturally um, had it not been for man's increasing. So they can sort of say past warming due to man was not just 0.8, but it was one or 1.2. And so that's how they are working to try to justify these forecasts. But it's a very difficult slog to get there, and we're not going to get into all the detail of that argument. And there's time delay issues and all kinds of things that you also have to take into account. But, but this is the chart that first convinced me that the high feedback cases were suspect, that we have not seen anywhere near the warming we might expect the high feedback cases were true. Um, the warming seems to be consistent with a no feedback or negative feedback case, which is also what the intuition of a natural scientist would tell you probably is the case before they ever studied the just from experience in other systems okay now we're going to jump into all these other effects and this is sort of a political scientific whack-a-mole game i mean there's so many articles that come out every year with somebody saying you know acne it's going to lead to more acne or change animal behavior or more rain or less rain or more snow or this storm or that storm and everything else and so it, it's it's almost impossible to nail down everyone but i'm going to give you five ways, five structural failures uh, behind a lot of the media discussion of those. And, and these are the five here. And this will help you maybe be a better consumer of what tends to be pretty shoddy media coverage of a lot of these uh, climate change effects. And the first one we're going to talk about is publication bias. And I need to explain what that is. 
And by doing that, I'm going to go out of climate. We're going to talk about something that happened in 2001, which was called Summer of the Shark. Uh, this is an actual Time Magazine cover from that summer. In June of 2001, I think it was a little boy got um, caught on film. And that was unusual at the time. We didn't all have cell phone cameras. Got caught on film being chomped by a shark. Um, that got put on national news and got such great ratings uh, and so much attention. Same reason that Shark Week is a ratings builder on, on the cable channels. Um, that they started putting sharks on. Every time there's a shark attack, they publicize it. It was on the news every night. Shark, 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 shark. Uh, in fact, um, it was until 9-11, it was the third, if you tracked all the stories that year, by the amount of uh, time it had on the major national news show, it was the third most amount of time. Uh, just an incredible amount of time was spent on this, and that's why we had this cover, Summer of the Shark. And I will tell you, everybody in the United States would have sworn to you that something unusual was happening in 2001, and that 2001, with 76 attacks leading to five deaths, was an unusually high year of shark attacks. But in fact, the previous year, 2000, there had been 85 attacks rather than 76, and there had been 12 deaths rather than five. In fact, 2001, the supposed summer of the shark, was a down year for shark attacks. But it's very easy to substitute in your head. It's very easy to be fooled by the frequency of media coverage for an event to fool and to think that somehow is proportional to the frequency of the underlying event itself, which it's not. So in other words, a spike in media coverage, even when a change in the frequency of the underlying event, can cause everybody to think the underlying event has changed frequency. And we see this in climate all the time, uh, whether it be tornadoes and hurricanes. They all get covered now. Extreme weather events always makes the national news, which leaves the impression that somehow these are more common when in fact they're not. The other thing that happens is, is that these extreme events really drive ratings at places like the Weather Channel, which is a new, sort of, uh, relatively new all-weather uh, channel. And the Weather Channel, for example, names winter storms now. They said the winter storm Saturn, East Coast Beast. Well, that sounds really badass and scary. We used to not name it. It was just like snow and buffalo, right? And so, again, it supports the impression that things are getting worse climate-wise when we start kind of naming things, even though nothing's really changed. The next one is going to seem funny to you. You're going to say, how is that possible? You know, that's, nobody actually does that. And then you're going to start watching the news. And you're going to see it happen all the time and not just in climate. And that's what I call claiming a trend from a single data point. A great example of this was Hurricane Katrina or really any Sandy or any hurricane. As soon as a hurricane hits, and sometimes even as soon as a snowstorm hits of all things, but as soon as a major storm hits the, uh, or a drought hits or anything, the media will say, that's due to climate change. But really what they're doing is they're extrapolating from a single data point. The, the fact of Katrina existing can't be proof of a trend in hurricanes, but Al Gore used it that way. He said that there's Katrina, therefore there's an upward trend. But that makes no sense. And in fact, if you actually look at the data, there's been no upward trend in the count of tropical storms and hurricanes. You see it right here. Now, the count of tropical storms and hurricanes is not that useful. They tend to vary a lot in strength. So what you can actually do is you can actually sort of aggregate and integrate the total uh, cumulative uh, energy in the storms in a year. And that's what this chart is. And it shows something very cyclical. There's cyclical up and down, which every hurricane studier in the world knows that hurricanes have a multi-decade cycle they follow of peaks and troughs. And so we see cyclicality in the strength and number of storms, but we don't see any upward trend. You see the same thing in droughts. Everybody says California drought, therefore there's a trend. Well, a single drought doesn't mean a trend. And in fact, if you look from the U.S. government data at the total acreage percent of the U.S. that's in drought conditions, it's actually a declining trend. There's actually less dry weather than there was, you know, 100 years ago. The other one that surprises a lot of people is people immediately expect, well, if global warming is doing everything, anything, we should see more heat waves and, and, and peaks. And every time there's a heat wave or a record high temperature, it's always blamed on global warming. But in fact, if you look at heat waves, by far, the, the, the most records were all set in the 1930s. We see a little bit of recent upward trend in heat waves, but, but nothing matching the big peak that you saw back in the 30s. You see the same thing if you look at temperature stations that have been, you obviously can't look at temperature 
stations have just been around for 10 years because all their records are in the last 10 years. But if you look at temperature stations that have been around for the last 100 years, you'll see that there's no upward trend in the number of 100 degree days. There's no upward trend in the number of 110 degree days. Uh, there's no upward trend shown in the red actually in high temperature, in, in high temperature records at all. In fact, um, most of them, still the majority of them are being set back in the 1930s, the Dust Bowl and such. But I will, and so you say, how can that be? How can we have global warming? Because I showed you the temperature rising. Shouldn't we see more of these daily high temperatures? In fact, we don't as much as you would expect because most of the global warming is showing up at night. What we actually see is warmer nights. And so this is, doesn't always make sense, but what we see is more record high nighttime lows. And that's what this blue line is. This is high T min. This is if on a day, if, if it only got down, if it got down to 60 and every day in history, it always got down to a temperature lower than that. That's a high uh, nighttime low. That's a high T min. And in fact, we are seeing near record numbers of, of these high nighttime lows. So where we're seeing the global warming signal is actually not in the daytime highs that always get published in the news media. It's in warmer nights. Measurement technology bias. This one's a classic. It's one of my favorite stories. Al Gore showed a chart, basically this chart in his movie. Uh, well, it didn't go quite to the current time because his movie was several years ago. But um, it's of tornadoes, and it's from the NOA. It's on their site. There's a little symbol. Shows them going from 200 in 1950 to 1800. Well, that looks like a smoking gun. That's broken climate. See climate change. Look at right there. We get all these tornadoes now. Well, if you go to the NOAA site, which I guess Al Gore didn't or just ignored it, but there's a big disclaimer on this that says, don't use this chart because there's a measurement technology bias. In the year 2010, we have storm chasers and Doppler radar. We don't miss tornadoes out in the middle of nowhere. We did in 1950. So the NOAA will tell you, if you want to look at a trend, look at large large tornadoes. Look at the F3, that's Ferrugida 3 and higher, 345 uh, uh, scale. And uh, uh, tornadoes, the largest tornadoes, because we didn't tend to miss them in the 50s. And so when you look at that, you see no upward trend in large tornadoes. In fact, if you banged a trend line on that, you'd see there's actually a, a, a small downward trend in the number of large tornadoes in the United States. What is normal? People always say the weather is abnormal. But what does that mean? What was normal? Where was what? What was the normal year? And and one a good example of where this comes into play is glaciers. People will say glaciers are retreating, therefore man-made global warming. Well, glaciers are retreating, probably related to warming. We've seen that warming's happened naturally since the end of the Little Ice Age. And so, in fact, is it abnormal that glaciers are retreating? Well, glaciers are retreating today. That's correct. But they were retreating in 1950. And you can see from this line, if you follow this line, this is as it goes down. And as the downward slope means they're retreating. This is the, the total length of glaciers and measured in the study. Glaciers are retreating in 1900. Glaciers are retreating in 1850. In fact, glaciers are retreating ever since the early 1800s when we started moving out of the Little Ice Age. So clearly, this retreat here was not due to man-made you know, CO2 in cars. It just wasn't, okay? This was a natural effect. So you have to sort of argue, well, if this is unnatural here, somehow due to man, you have to say that this whole effect stopped and then this effect, right as this effect was taking up. And it's really hard to make that argument because there's no evidence for it. So you have to ask yourself, what is normal? And normal for glaciers for the last 200 years, even before man-made CO2, was to be... You see the same thing as sea level rise. This is sea level rise since 1880, but you can go all the way back to about 1810, 1820 and see the same thing. The sea levels have steadily risen at about the same pace all the way through the time that we've been recording sea levels. Um, they have accelerated a little bit, so they've been going up two, three millimeters a year for all these years. What we've seen recently is maybe an extra millimeter a year. So maybe that's the equivalent of an extra uh, tenth of a meter or perhaps three or four inches a century 
uh, due to man. But you can't blame the current sea level rise entirely on man when the normal for sea levels for 200 years has been to be steadily rising. You have to, only part you can blame on man potentially is an increase from this trend of sea level rise, and that increase is really small. Finally, we talk about collapsing causality into a complex system of a complex system into a single variable. This is really the hubris of a lot of climate science, but it's the hubris of economics too. Everybody in the whole world, every senator, every representative will, if there's some economic recovery, they will blame their one niche, they will credit their one niche little bill that they passed years ago um, to help the sugar industry or something for that recovery. Um, the other day I heard an interview of uh, Scott Pruitt, who's the uh, Trump's new head of the EPA, and and uh, somebody who obviously was a very strong uh, catastrophic global warming believer, was asking him, said, said, you know, don't you believe? And the exact quote was, don't you believe that CO2 is the is the is the main control knob for climate? The main control knob for climate. Well, calling one gas, by the way, that's at four hundredths of a percent concentration in the atmosphere, the main control knob for climate. It's like calling the sugar industry the main control knob for the U.S. economy. It's, it's again, pure hubris. There are thousands of variables in the climate. If anything's the main control knob for climate, it's the sun. And then after that, there's many, many, many variables, the oceans and their changing cycles and the currents and the circulation systems and all those kinds of things. And we've agreed that CO2 is one of those many things. That's, that, that causes some incremental warming from the greenhouse gas effect. But to call it the main control novel, knob is just crazy. And here's sort of an illustration of this. This is in Fahrenheit for the first time. This is actual average temperatures uh, rather than that anomaly. And this is for the U.S. And so this is monthly. Uh, the blue goes down to what's the lowest the, the U.S. average has gotten for that month. This is the highest the U.S. average has gotten for that month, and the green is, is sort of where the average bounces around in. And so you can sort of see the T-max, T-min, and average for each month. And again, if you looked at individual locations, you see a much higher variation all the way from, you know, Arizona down to negative for Alaska. But you see month-to-month, day-to-day, year-to-year, you see an incredible amount of range of variation. And it's this dotted line that is... The, the long-term temperature trend in the U.S., about a degree Fahrenheit. So to sort of say that that dotted line is from one cause, when you have all these other variables banging temperatures around monthly, daily, by location, by year, it's just pure hubris in mind. We know that CO2 is a contributor, but it's not the, quote, primary control knob. So this is where we are. Just to summarize before I get into a, a few last points, um, I agree that the doubling of CO2 would increase temperatures about one degree C, but I think the feedback assumption of heavy positive feedback is grossly exaggerated. It might even be negative feedback. Um, I agree the world is warmed about eight tenths of a C, though that might be exaggerated. And I think man maybe has caused about half of that. And But from that, the evidence of warming causing all these changes and things is really low, in part because we haven't had that much warming on a, on a historic basis, and in part because there's just a lot of poor science and even poor reporting going into all these effects. Remember way back I said that there's a 97% consensus, so I said there's a consensus as to what? And so this is the first study, and so it's very interesting. So they surveyed all these scientists, and it was kind of funny. They got 3,100 scientists responded, but they deemed that only 77 could be uh, considered real, quote unquote, climate scientists, and of that 75 answered um, a similar way to these two questions. And I'll tell you how they answered. And then think about how I would answer, okay? So, so by answering in a specific way to these two questions is how they got the 97%. The 97% said, when compared with pre-1800s level, do you think the mean global temperatures have generally fallen, risen, fallen, or remained relatively constant? Well, the 97% said risen. Well, what would I have said? I told you today, I think that since the pre-1800s levels, temperatures have risen too. So I agree. I'm right in there. I'm right there. I could say risen. They said risen. Number two, do you think human activity is a significant contributing factor in changing mean global temperatures? Well, I thought it's uh, temperature increases are about half. Uh, by the way, the people on the 97% said yes to two. I thought the temperature increase due to man was about half of past temperatures. Half is probably significant. I think there's other things like land use that also contributes. 
So I would have said yes to two. So suddenly I'm in the 97%. I, who consistently called a climate denier, answered the exact same way as the 97% in this study. Um, which is funny because the 97% is constantly thrown in my face that I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to debate you. I don't need to hear what you're saying because of the 97%. Well, I'm about to agree with the 97%. So maybe you should listen to me and figure out what I'm saying that's different than those guys because it's not in those two assumptions. And so this is where we come to the debate. It's, it's so poorly portrayed in the media and it's so frustrating because the sources of skeptic disagreement tend to be around not greenhouse gas theory, but this theory that, or not that man has an effect, but that man affects being exaggerated by these assumptions of strong positive feedback. We don't, and we think it's exaggerated and think that the strong positive feedbacks are not justified, but you never see any discussion of that in, in, in the climate debate. And that's why one of the reasons we talk past each other because the media coverage of, of climate is just plain broken. So that's the ultimate irony if you walk away from this is is we've talked about you know a part of the warming an incremental part that green lights from green, greenhouse gas theory in their own theory and the alarmist most of the warming in the alarmist forecast is from climate positive feedback theory but climate positive feedback theory which causes most of the warming is never discussed in the media and every time a skeptic tries to disagree with it immediately they're told hey the greenhouse gas theory is settled science shut up when despite the fact that we're agreeing with the greenhouse gas theory and trying to point to this other theory. So this is the real kind of frustration of the climate debate. And if you think that people talk past each other, this is a big reason why. The other, after I go through all this, I, I tend to get a couple of standard responses. The most, one I get the most of the time is said, well, we got this thing called the precautionary principle, which says if there's even a small chance that you're wrong, if the small chance that we have this catastrophic, uh, situation rise we need to start spending lots of money and time and effort and even loss of liberty to try to to try to combat the the small chance that this is going to happen because we always follow the precautionary principle and that's actually wrong we we actually never follow the precautionary principle and when we do it's disastrous one of the reasons we don't have as much medical innovation as we could, as we could is because the fda has started almost following the precautionary principle in releasing drugs. If we had followed the precautionary principle 100 years from now, we wouldn't even have aspirin to use. So we don't tend to follow the precautionary principle. But the other major flaw of this argument is it assumes that there's nothing counterbalancing the risk of, of global warming. So they're saying there's a 1% chance of a catastrophe. 1% of a disaster is still a really bad number. And so that counterbalances everything, but it doesn't. There's a whole lot of things on the other end of the scale that you would hurt with immediate, strong, cl expensive climate action. For example, d over the last you know, 30, 40 years, over a billion people have emerged from poverty. This is an unprecedented time in history of the number of people finally exiting poverty and, and gaining some you know, new hope in their lives for advancement, you know, development, poverty reduction, economic growth, improving food supply, improving health, and even being ready for hurricanes and tornadoes, disaster preparedness, often depend on cheap energy, cheap fossil fuels. When these countries are developing, they're doing it by burning every fossil fuel they can get their hands on. And so by raising the price of energy, by limiting energy sources to much more difficult and expensive and higher technology ones to use, um, you're not just a small chance, you're absolutely like 100% chance of consigning a lot of people in the world to poverty. And that's got to be balanced against um, the small chance of global warming when you're deciding to do these kinds of things. And here's an illustration of that. I, I, this is, this is um, uh, analysis that you can do online, taking World Bank data. And I've taken two things. And the bottom is CO2 emissions, and that's a logarithmic scale. And that's CO2 emissions per capita. So each dot on here is a country. And so it's plotted with their CO2 emissions on the x-axis and that country's life expectancy at birth on the y-axis. So for example, US's uh, CO2 emissions is probably about 20 or 30 metric tons per capita by this scale. And their, their life expectancy at birth is somewhere in the high 70s. And you see all the different countries on here. You can see a direct, almost linear relationship between 
CO2 emissions and life expectancy. In fact, every 10x increase in CO2 emissions correlates to about a 10 year increase in life expectancy. People live longer in countries that burn more CO2. Now that doesn't mean, I'm not stupid, that doesn't mean that somehow CO2 has a health effect or something. This is a, an indirect relationship, but it says CO2 is a proxy for cheap energy and development and economic growth and all the things that help people live longer. And if you did this over time, you would see countries like China, which is actually pretty far up and to the right, has been moving that way, has been moving right up that orange line for the last 30 years. As they burn, as their country economy grows, as they create more CO2, as they burn more cheap fossil fuels, they've been able to do things to their health, their medicine, to their, to, to their, lifestyle of their food supply that's increased the life expectancy dramatically. So CO2 and the cheap fuels that, that produce it are, are important to the well-being of the world. So you don't just sort of say, well, we're going to eliminate them completely on the off chance that uh, we might possibly have this temperature disaster someday. Now in the United States, we actually can take action pretty easily. The United States is a super rich country. And it's actually easy for us to do these kinds of things. It wouldn't be that hard. And in fact, so I'm going to end my presentation today by proposing legislation for the U.S. that would be a low-cost climate insurance policy and recognize that um, I'm not, this is not a mini to be picked from. These have to go together in my mind as a unified plan or else you're not going to be able to work across the aisle from left and right and get agreement. The first is you have a carbon tax. Forget all this cap and trade. Cap and trade, is, trade ends up being a bunch of cronious nonsense, at least as it's been practiced in carbon. It worked okay in things like sulfur dioxide, but in carbon tax, it, carbon, it just works terrible. You have a carbon tax on fuels, higher tax based on their, their carbon content. So coal would have the most, natural gas would have the least. And, and, and you let markets figure out based on that higher price, it's called a Pagovian tax that lets markets take into account that higher price and they act from that. So that means there's a higher price umbrella for people to innovate with substitutes like solar and the higher price also incentivizes conservation and all kinds of other things. So basically you end up with less carbon fuel use from the carbon tax and markets and, and individual ingenuity are left to figure out the best way to do it. To get to sell this obviously to the right side of the aisle, you're going to have to make it uh, not a net tax increase. So you're going to offset the carbon tax with a reduction in other taxes. Since the carbon tax on fuel is likely to be regressive, meaning to hit the poor on a higher percentage basis, the rest, I would suggest we eliminate the payroll tax. That's another regressive tax. And in fact, substituting a sales tax on carbon based fuels is probably economically better for most folks than have. And if at the same time we reduce the sales tax on the use of labor. Um, third is we're going to end all these stupid government investment and subsidy and mandate programs on ethanol and wind and solar and electric vehicles and cafe standards and all those kinds of things. Government bureaucrats don't pick the right approach to, to saving fuel. They pick the approach that's politically, you know, helps the most of their supporters or helps them personally or helps their agency personally. It, it's not a thoughtful economic scientific approach. Uh, the carbon tax takes care of all this by incentivizing people to do the most efficient things to reduce carbon-based fuel use. And so we end all these other stupid mandates uh, that don't really do a very good job at that. And finally, we almost certainly, if you really want to have a growing, thriving economy in the future without a CO2 production, you almost have to work on your nuclear program. Um, I will confess that I think nuclear was pushed too early. I think that's why we have a lot of problems with nuclear is it was not a mature technology when we started really going after it early on. I think that that actually the same thing ironically happened to the space race. We, we pushed an immature technology and then space travel really died for 20 or 30 years and is only now coming around as our space technology has gotten more mature. I think the same thing is true in the nuclear energy field. I think there's a lot of new generation technologies that would allow us to safely ramp up nuclear uh, electricity production. So the message of this presentation is that man-made global warming exists. The world has warmed. Greenhouse gas theory is a fact but the catastrophe is likely not. And uh, when you go to the climate debate, hopefully you can be better trained to look at uh, the, the, the mistakes the media make in portraying climate change, things like trying to draw a trend out of a single data point. And I hope you'll be more educated about climate forecasts now that you've seen 
uh, everything that goes into it that's not just greenhouse gas theory, but the, mostly the, of the forecast comes from these assumptions of positive feedback, which are much harder to prove. Uh, so I guess the basic message to summarize all that up is don't panic. <laughs>